In chapter one, we didn't do a lot of biology. We briefly defined what biology was, we talked about biological literacy, and then most of our chapter was focused on the scientific method. In chapter four, we actually get into some hardcore biology. And we start off our talk about biology with the cell. The reason that we do that is the cell is the smallest unit that scientists consider to be living, basically self-sustaining. So if we're gonna talk about the cell, we need to talk about what it means to be alive. Oh, before I get to that, sorry. <laughs> In this lecture, we're gonna talk about what life is, how we define it. We're gonna talk about what a cell is, the two major types of cells uh, present in living organisms. We're gonna talk about the characteristics of those different types of cells. And then we're also gonna talk about the structure and function of the cell membrane, which encloses every cell. And we're gonna talk about how the cell actually moves things in and out across the cell membrane. So let's get back to our definition of life. All right, so we're a biology class. You all probably know at this point that biology is the study of life. Bio meaning life and ology meaning study. So what do we mean by life? Well, if you think about um, any living organism, if you just pick one in your mind, you can probably identify some things about it that would tell you that it is living. Maybe it breathes, maybe it moves, maybe it eats maybe it grows um, and this might be compared to something like a rock that just sits there unless some outside force moves it or shapes it it's not doing anything on its own to change or move so all of those things are fine um, but some of those things only define certain organisms for example you might look at your pet cat or dog or fish and say, oh, I know that's living because it moves. It moves on its own. But you might look at a plant and think, well, I know that is living, but it's not moving. But it is doing some of the other things that you would call living, like growing, like taking in oxygen, even if you can't see it. So when we're defining what is living, we're actually defining a really broad category of organisms. We're defining things like humans and animals and insects that move and grow. And then we're also defining things like plants that don't move but still exhibit some of these other characteristics. We're also trying to define things like bacteria that are single-celled organisms and things like algae that are really simple but still made up of a few cells. And then we also might be thinking about things like viruses that really live in sort of a shady area between living and non-living because they have some characteristics of living organisms, but they're lacking some others that are really important. So there are several characteristics that as biologists we use to define that something is alive and therefore falls under this study of biology. The first one is that living organisms are a complex ordered organization. Actually, that should say organism. Sorry, organism consisting of one or more cells. So something like a bacterium, that's singular for bacteria. A bacterium is made up of only one cell but it does exhibit these other characteristics and therefore we consider it living. Whereas humans are made of trillions of cells and they're still considering, considered living organisms. They are complex and they are organized into a single living organism. For the rest of these characteristics, we're not gonna spend as much time on them. And for most of them, I'm going to list them because either we don't cover them in this class or we're gonna cover them in a lot more detail later. So uh, living organisms also use and transform energy to perform work. Now this means that they take in nutrients and use it to allow their body to grow and um, process their food, interact with um, their environment by moving, things like that. 
They also show sensitivity and responsiveness to an external environment. So if you think back to that rock I was talking about, just lays there in the sun for all eternity unless something comes and moves it. Whereas your cat might play with toys and snuggle you and scratch you when it's angry and beg for food, things like that. Characteristics of living organisms also include regulation and homeostasis. So regulation just means um, controlling um, the processes within um, the living system. So how it breaks down food, things like that. Homeostasis is taking that those processes to maintain a stable internal environment. For example, we maintain our own temperature. So a lot of our energy comes to keeping our body at a constant temperature. Um, all living organisms grow, develop, and reproduce. Um, you know this, if you are a person, you've grown up from a baby all the way to a 16, 18, 25 year old, whatever you happen to be. And over that time, you've grown, you've developed, you've changed. Uh, some of you maybe have even reproduced at this point. Even if you personally have not reproduced, your cells are reproducing. Inside your body, your cells are reproducing all the time. So reproduction is a characteristic of all living organisms. And finally, living organisms um, evolve and adapt um, to their environment through a process called descent with modification. Now, um, when we get to evolution, we'll see that individuals do not evolve, but as a whole, a group of organisms can evolve. And that change over time to become better suited for their environment as a whole is a characteristic of living organisms. So within these characteristics, we see two major themes. Um, one is organization. Organization of cells into living organisms, organization of processes to maintain homeostasis, to grow, to develop, and then evolution. Now I know there's only one topic here under living organisms that says anything about evolution, but um, one of the most important themes in biology is evolution and living organisms can evolve and do evolve. All right, so we're gonna focus on only one of these characteristics of living organisms today, and that is that all organisms are made of cells. Now, the cell is the smallest unit of life that performs all of the necessary functions to be considered living. So cells take in nutrients, they grow, they develop, they reproduce, they interact with their environment. There's really not much smaller than a cell until you start getting into chemistry. Cells are made up of different molecules, um, different elements, things like that. Um, but when you really start looking at things, cells are pretty much one of the smallest. So cells are the smallest unit that can function independently, um, which is why we do see many, many organisms, um, bacteria, another group called archaea that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we see these groups of living organisms that are only one cell, and they can perform all of these functions very, very nicely. Um, many organisms on our planet are actually multicellular, so they're made up of a whole bunch of cells that are interacting, that are sharing nutrients, sharing resources, sharing products, communicating, and whatnot amongst each other. So in this figure here, these are three examples, very diverse examples of um, organisms that are made up of cells. We've got this mushroom, a gazelle, and a head louse which is basically head lice. Um, so three very different organisms that are all made up of trillions, billions, millions um, of cells that are all helping this organism to live and to grow. So one of the basic tenets in biology is the cell theory. So remember from chapter one, and you should pause and remember, try to quiz yourself, remember what theory means. Remember from chapter one that a theory is a hypothesis that has been supported over and over and over again. Now, 
it is not a law, it is not definitive in the sense that it cannot be disproven. In fact, a theory can be disproven. But something becomes a theory because it's been tested over and over and over and over again with all kinds of different hypotheses related to it, and it still holds to be true in the situations that they test. Keep in mind, because it is actually still in a way a hypothesis, it is falsifiable, but we haven't figured out anything that proves it to be false yet. So uh, the cell theory is one of the unifying theories in biology and something that it is that is accepted by all biologists. Now there are two parts of the cell theory. One is that all living organisms are made up of one or more cells. Now I talked about bacteria just a few minutes ago. Um, that's a big example of our single-celled organisms. Um, here we have three different examples of multicellular organisms that are being made up of a collection of cells. So we have humans, the collection of cells, mushrooms, collection of cells, um, plants, collection of cells. Now you might notice that these cells actually look a little bit different. Um, the human cells compared to the plant cells um, have slightly different shapes. Um, and we will talk about why that is in just a little bit. The second part of the cell theory is that all cells arise from other pre-existing cells. What does that mean? That means that cells reproduce. Okay, so sometimes when we talk about reproduction, we're talking about reproduction at the cellular level, and sometimes we are talking about it at the organism level. Either way, they, they both go back to a cell giving way to daughter cells. So the other, the sort of the flip side of this is that cells don't come out of nowhere. They have to come from a parent cell. They do not just spontaneously appear. New organisms do not just spontaneously appear. They have to come from a pre-existing cell. There are two main types of cells that are found on Earth, and in fact, there are only two main types of cells. Those two types are the eukaryotic cell and the prokaryotic cell. Now, if we look at a prokaryotic cell or several different types of prokaryotic cells, we'll notice that they are actually appear to be very simple, but they make up an extremely diverse array of organisms. The most abundant type of organism on earth are actually bacteria, which are single-celled prokaryotic organisms. If we look at eukaryotic cells, they are much more complex, um, much more diverse in their types, um, but the number of organisms that may, are made up of eukaryotic cells is actually much smaller than the number of bacteria. But let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So the main feature of a eukaryotic cell is that it has a central control, control structure called a nucleus. So if we were to draw a general sh shape of a cell, it's gonna have one main part inside that it's gonna be, that's gonna be really obvious if we were to look at it in a microscope, and that is called the nucleus. And it's sort of the center, the control center, or the brain of the cell. And in that nucleus, we have DNA. That DNA is the coding molecule that provides all of the instructions for how that cell is going to live, grow, perform its work, etc. Organisms that are made up of eukaryotic cells are called eukaryotes. Our second type of cell is called the prokaryotic cell. The major difference here is that a prokaryotic cell does not have a nucleus, but it does actually still have DNA. DNA is the coding molecule in prokaryotic cells as well that provides all of the instructions for function, living, growing, and interacting with its environment. Individuals that are made up of a prokaryotic cell are called prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are always unicellular, 
which means they are always made up of one single cell. This is in contrast to eukaryotes, which are made up of multiple cells or called multicellular. So prokaryotes have four basic structural features. And those four features are shared among all prokaryotes. Those four major features are the plasma membrane, which is a membrane, excuse me, a membrane that surrounds the cell. You can see it on your screen here in green. So all cells are going to have a plasma membrane. All cells are going to have cytoplasm, which is basically a fluid jelly-like substance inside the cells that sort of, um, all of the part, the inner parts of the cell are sort of floating and suspended in. All cells are gonna have DNA. Remember, that's our coding molecule that gives information for all of the cells within our body or within um, any organism. And then they are going to have a little structure, a whole bunch of little structures called ribosomes. Now ribosomes are really important because ribosomes take the information from our DNA and turn it into proteins. You're probably familiar with protein from your diet, but proteins make up a large part of our body. And proteins are really important because they are essentially the worker bees of our cells. Proteins go around and perform all the functions of our cells. They can be um, proteins that do a job, they can be proteins that are a product, they can be intermediates within products. So proteins are essential to how a cell works and lives. Now these four structures in all prokaryotes are also found in all eukaryotes. So these four structures are present in all cell types, no matter if you are prokaryote or eukaryote. You have a plasma membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, and ribosomes. For now, we're focused on prokaryote, so let's talk about some of the additional structures in a prokaryote. Most prokaryotes also have a cell wall, and that is this brown structure on the outside. Cell walls are sort of a more rigid, protective structure on the cell. They provide protection from the outside environment. They provide um, an outside, almost like an exoskeleton on an insect, an outside support structure and protection for that prokaryote. Um, they also might have a capsule, which is sort of an outer protective coating they may have pili, which are these hair-like structures on the outside. They allow them, uh, prokaryotes, to attach to other surfaces. Um, sometimes they are important in transferring genetic material between two prokaryotes. And then um, prokaryotes sometimes also have a flagellum. So you are probably familiar with a flagellum if you think of a um, uh, think of a sperm. Um, it's that whip-like structure on the end of the sperm that you probably all learned about in reproduction in your health class in high school. Um, but uh, flagellum are essentially there as um, propellers. They um, flap around and help the organism move through um, its environment. So these additional structures are not found in all, but um, many of them are found in most of your prokaryotes. All right, so eukaryotic cells are um, much different in that they actually have compartments within the cell that give them specialized function. So if we go back real quick, um, you might notice that everything within this cell, the DNA, the ribosomes, the cytoplasm, are all sort of 
uh, floating within there, at least imagine that they're floating. Um, and they're not separated from anything else that's going on in the cell. So if this bacterium or whatever this happens to be brings in, it is a bacterium, brings in some nutrients, um, it's just gonna come in and float around in the cell. And the cell will take care of it, the cell will use it up, um, but it's not separated from any other component, component within the cell. But eukaryotic cells have compartments that are surrounded by membranes. And these compartments are called membrane bound organelles. So this is kind of a funny word, membrane bound organelles. This means there is a structure on the outside of these compartments that isolates them from other structures within the cell. So here we have some examples of those organelles. Now you can remember this word if you think about the word organ. When you think about the word organ, you probably think about something like your heart or your, that's supposed to be a heart, your liver, your kidneys. These are small parts of you that provide very specific functions within your body. So these organelles are just little organs inside your cells. So on the left side here, we have eukaryotic cells. You can see that big nucleus that I talked about a minute ago in a previous cell. That is where we contain all of our DNA, all of the instructions for our cells. And then at the moment, you'll just have to take my word for it that there are other organelles in here that are doing different functions within the cells. We also have cytoplasm here. It is stained kind of pink. That cytoplasm suspends those organelles um, around the nucleus inside that plasma membrane and um, sort of provides a little bit of structure for that cells, the, sorry, for that cell. Um, one of the characteristics of eukaryotic cells is that they're larger than prokaryotic cells. They are about, or at least, 10 times larger. On the right, we have prokaryotic cells. This is a bunch of prokaryotic cells that are far smaller than that single eukaryotic cell. You'll notice, or at least you'll have to take my word for it, that we've got the plasma membrane and cell walls surrounding those cells. But you might notice that there's no defined nucleus. There are no other organelles. It all kind of looks like a swirly mess in there. And that's because there are no organelles in prokaryotes. So internal structures are not organized into compartments. Remember that there is DNA in there because that's the coding molecule that we need for all of our cells. Just can't really see it in this picture. You actually can't see it unless you know what you're looking for in that nucleus over there anyway. Um, and again, they are much smaller than, the, than a corresponding eukaryotic cell. So the important thing here is that there are no compartments, so no membrane-bound organelles and no nucleus. So we are going to go through um, some of these structures that are found in our eukaryotic cells. And the two that we're going to focus on are animal cells and plant cells. Now, for the most part, or the majority of the organelles that are found in either animal or plant cells are actually going to be the same. So everything listed in this box here are found in both animal and plant cells. So the good news there is that you only have to learn the function in one of them because it's the same in both of them. So the nucleus has the same function in animal cells as it does in plant cells. There are a few organelles that are found in one or the other. So these centrioles are found only in animal cells 
And then this group over here, plant cells, contain chloroplast cell wall and vacuole that are for the most part only found in plants. Vacuoles are sometimes found in animal cells, but honestly for this class, we're just gonna go with vacuoles only in plant cells. So in a later video, we're gonna come back to the function of all of these organelles. Yes, you need to know the function of these organelles, but as I said, most of them are the same in animal and plant cells. You might recognize we've already talked about some of these a little bit, the nucleus, the ribosomes. Some of these you might actually remember from previous science courses, mitochondria, chloroplasts. So hopefully some of this will be familiar to you. The way that I test this, sometimes I ask you to look and identify a structure. Sometimes I ask you to tell me what that structure is. Sometimes I give you a function and ask you what organelle is performing that function. Again, this is where memorizing is going to come in very handy. But we're gonna come back to what the specific functions of these organelles are in just a little bit. Before we do that, let's talk about the origin of organelles. So we're going to focus first on the origin of two organelles, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. Now the origin of these two organelles is defined by something called the endosymbiosis theory. Well, I learned it as endosymbiont. Doesn't really matter, it means the same thing. Um, so whichever I say, that's what I mean. Endosymbiosis or endosymbiont theory. Please take a minute to memorize this word. Say it out loud a few times, learn how to spell it. This is the most misspelled, mispronounced word in all of Biology 100. And if you need to recall it and you can't figure out the word, you're gonna have problems. So it is pronounced endosymbiosis. So let's talk about what this word means. Endo means inside or within. And symbiosis means a beneficially, a, yes, beneficially, excuse me, mutually beneficial relationship. So this theory says that these two organelles, the chloroplast and the mitochondria, arose from a mutually beneficial relationship inside a cell. So let's talk about what that means. <clears throat> so according to the theory of, theory of endosymbiosis, two different types of prokaryotes worked in close partnerships. In other words, we had two prokaryotic cells that were dependent on each other. They formed a mutually beneficial relationship. So let's talk about how this might have happened. So the endosymbiosis theory says that there was an ancestral prokaryote and it engulfed another ancestral prokaryote. Now I'm using the word ancestral because we're going to give rise to eukaryotes. So essentially the ancestor to eukaryotic cells were, was a prokaryotic cell that evolved a mutually beneficial relationship with another prokaryotic cell. So the theory is that this happened in a few steps. One, ancestral prokaryote number one engulfed, essentially eight, prokaryote number two. Now prokaryote number two was really important because it was efficient at converting food and oxygen into energy. Now you can imagine that once this cell engulfed that, and didn't consume it, not sure why it didn't just consume it, but, uh, or break it down, uh, once it got inside this other prokaryote, 
it was able to take food from the bigger prokaryote and utilize it and in turn give energy to that bigger cell. So here's where we form our mutually beneficial relationship. All right, so we have prokaryote one engulfs prokaryote two, doesn't eat it, realizes that this is really, really cool and has a source of energy that can come from inside of it. So this means that that prokaryote number two can take the other food that prokaryote one eats, convert it into energy for both of them to use. That's pretty beneficial if you're the big guy. All right, so over time, and the process of evolution, that prokaryote number one becomes a eukaryotic cell with an organelle called the mitochondrion. Now the mitochondria, as you can probably quote from high school biology, is the powerhouse of the cell. That's the number one correct answer that I get on this test. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And it evolved as a prokaryote originally who could convert food into energy. So over time, we have the merging of two prokaryotic cells into one eukaryotic cell that now contains the mitochondria. Now, some of those guys in that, from that cell line evolved into animal cells because if you go back to those summary slides I have of plant and animal cells, you'll notice that they have mitochondria. But another evolutionary branch moved on and became plant cells. In a second endosymbiotic event, those eukaryotic cells that were to become plant cells who already had a mitochondria also engulfed a second organelle called the chloroplast. So now we have another organelle that is forming a mutually beneficial relationship with that newly evolved eukaryotic cell. I guarantee I will ask you about this theory later on. All right, so the theory of endosymbiosis is supported by several observations, and all of these observations are based on the fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts have very similar characteristics to prokaryotes. Some of those characteristics include that they are similar in size to prokaryotic cells that we know of, and they divide by splitting, okay? Um, chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own ribosomes that are separate from the ribosomes in the rest of the cell. Remember, ribosomes make proteins from genetic information contained in our DNA. Chloroplasts and mitochondria also have small amounts of circular DNA. I didn't really note this earlier, but prokaryotes, if you look back at the picture of them, you can see it. Prokaryotes have circular DNA and eukaryotes have linear or long, thin DNA. So the DNA found in chloroplasts and mitochondria is more similar to prokaryotic cells than to eukaryotic cells. And then if you look at that DNA found in the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, you would find that it is much more closely related to bacterial DNA than to eukaryotic DNA. So the genetic information that is unique to those organelles is actually more similar to bacteria. So we talked about the origin of those mitochondria and chloroplasts, but those mitochondria and chloroplasts are only a few of the organelles that are found in eukaryotic cells. So you might be wondering, or you might not, that's okay too, what is the origin of those other organelles? So some of them, mitochondria and chloroplasts, were produced by endosymbiosis. The others, were produced by invagination. So invagination basically means that the plasma membrane of the cell 
sort of pinches in and closes in on itself. So you can see here we've got sort of an indentation in vagination in our plasma membrane. And then what happens is that the, the plasma membrane sort of fuses around it and you end up with these organelles, just bear with me there, you end up with these organelles that are actually made up of plasma membrane and come from invagination of that plasma membrane. Now all of those organelles are part of what we call the endomembrane system. Okay, so remember endo means inside. We know what membrane means mostly at this point, which is just the um, outer material of the cell. So all of these that are produced by invagination are called the endomembrane system. And we'll talk about what those are in a later video.